is we're going to look at consequences of the Cauchy integral formula. And so we talked last time about just how truly impressive this result is. And the reason it's so important is we figure out what's going on at the point z by understanding what's going on along the boundary. So here's a corollary. Let's say c is a circle of radius r, then the nth derivative at z in absolute value is less than equal to what? Well, if we put absolute values here, uh, let's say send it at z. Then this is going to have distance r, so this will be r to the n plus 1. We'll put the maximum of zeta on the circle of the f of zeta. The radius of the circle is r, so the perimeter is going to be 2 pi r. Well, the 2 pi cancels the 2 pi there. And so this is just going to be the maximum of the absolute value of f of zeta, zeta on the circle, divided by r to the n. So it tells us that if we have a holomorphic function on a disk, and c is a circle about the point z of radius r, then the derivative cannot be too large. Now, of course, we have to remember where we're taking the maximum. We're taking the maximum over the circle of radius r. But the largest circle you can take, does that help you more and more? Well, you've got to be careful because you have the maximum value over here. right? So this maximum value could change as you take a circle larger and larger. As a nice corollary of the corollary, I know, corollary squared, if f is entire, this means defined on all of c and bounded, then we can finally prove one of our shocking results from day one of the course. What do you think the result will be is if f is entire and bounded? Then f is constant. So this is strikingly different than the real case. You know, in the real case, we have functions like sine and cosine, or 1 over 1 plus x squared. We have a slew of functions that are bounded, but not constant as a function of a real variable. In a complex variable, if your function is defined everywhere on all of c and is bounded, it must be constant. And the proof is very simple. The nth derivative at z in absolute value equals 0 if n is greater than or equal to 1. And the reason is, if we go back and use the corollary, if we just take n equals 1, or 2, or 3, or 4, we let the radius go to infinity. And since our function is bounded, the numerator is not changing. In general, if we didn't know the function was bounded, well, yes, this denominator is getting larger as r gets larger, but maybe the numerator is getting larger as well. If the function is bounded, however, that can't happen. So we know that the nth derivative is 0. So since the function is analytic, equals the sum of a n z to the n, n goes from 0 to infinity, reduces to just a0. And that's the proof. OK? Can you see the bottom, Ashman? Or? OK. So basically, it's just an immediate consequence of this using the fact that f is bounded. This is a striking difference between real and complex. So then the question is, what can we use this for? What good is something like this? Well, one of the applications of this is the fundamental theorem of algebra. How many fundamental theorems do you know? How many fundamental theorems? OK. OK. I think the difference is maybe the linear algebra one, which I do not really think should be merit. I don't think that should merit fundamental. All right. What are the fundamentals you know? Fundamental theorem of calculus. calculus. Algebra. Finally generated a billion. <laughs> uh, I never arithmetic. <laughs> we don't have that many fundamental theorems. Okay? You don't get the name fundamental unless you really merit it. Or you're in linear algebra. And you know, somehow there's a lobby that somehow got that classified as fundamental theorem because every subject must have a fundamental theorem. All right, let's do the fundamental theorem of algebra. 
fundamental theorem of algebra, say f of z equals, you know, a n, z to the n, plus a zero, each a j is in c, then f has exactly n roots. And of course, we allow the roots to have multiplicity. This is an absolutely amazing result. If we looked at the polynomial with integer coefficients, would you have to have n integer roots? No. So if you have integer coefficients, you know, consider you know, 2x minus 3 equals 0. So you can have a polynomial with integer roots, I'm sorry, with integer coefficients, but without integer roots. All right, what about <coughs> rational coefficients? We could look at x squared minus 2 equals 0. And we don't have any rational, all right. What about real coefficients? x squared plus 1 equals 0. In all these situations, things fail violently. The amazing thing, or fact, I should say fact, amazing fact, add i is or i am the square root of negative 1, and all is good. By adding the solutions to this one polynomial, we can now solve everything. That's astonishing. Okay? This does deserve the name fundamental. Okay? No matter what the coefficients are, we're going to have roots. How many of you have seen a proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra? Do you remember how it was proved? Okay, so some. Okay, so this is a heavy proof. Okay, anybody remember any non-heavy proofs? It's a shame that you haven't seen some of the bad algebraic proofs, so you would truly appreciate how great the proof you're about to see. There are some Calc three proofs, and I will put up some notes on that. Are there any polynomials where you know there has to be a root? Let's say we restrict to real polynomials. Any real polynomials where you know there must be a root? Odd degree. So if you have a polynomial of odd degree, it's, if it has real coefficients, well, as it goes off to plus infinity, as it goes off to minus infinity, it's going to go off in different ways. By the intermediate value theorem, it's got to be zero somewhere. So you know an odd polynomial with real coefficients has a root. You can then extract the root, and unfortunately, then the induction breaks down because now you have a polynomial of even degree. And polynomials of even degree with real coefficients need not have roots. The idea is if we have a root to a polynomial, we want to pull that out and deduce, you know, con you know, continue the factorization. The problem is if we only know how to find roots of odd degree polynomials, if we pull out just one root, we now have an even degree and now we're dead. What we're going to do in the complex cases, we're going to show that any complex polynomial has at least one root. Then you pull out that root and then you just apply the argument again. So we'll be okay there. This might remind you of something in linear algebra where you're finding eigenvalues. You first find one eigenvalue, eigenvector, you pull that out, and then you look at what's going on for the rest. All right, so proof suffices to show there exists a root. Let's prove it by contradiction. Assume not. So that means f of z is never equal to zero. So let's consider g of z equals 1 over f of z. What can you tell me about this function? It's holomorphic. f is a finite polynomial. The only time I'm in danger when I take a reciprocal is if I divide by zero. I'm assuming I don't divide by zero. So we must be getting a contradiction at some point. All right, what do you think the contradiction is going to be? What do you think we're going to prove about this function g? That it's constant. That it's constant. Makes sense. We just had this corollary to you know, proving you know, constancy. So the claim 
is g is constant. Do we all agree that g is not constant? I had a friend who left mathematics as a freshman because when they got to the fact that it was an integer and it was one half, they thought they were done and the professor wanted them to prove that one half is not an integer and they just left in frustration. I will leave it as an exercise for you to prove that g is not constant. We will assume, of course, that n here is positive. I'm not looking at the function f of z equals 5. Right? n is greater than or equal to 1 in the definition of f. So I will leave that once we have a constant g, I will leave that as an exercise that we are done. I will, let's consider what's going on with this function g. If z gets larger and larger and larger, what's happening with f? Well, if we go back and look at the definition of f, a n is going to be non-zero, because if a n was zero, why would I write it? Right? So typically, you, you put in little phrases like this. We'll assume a n does not equal zero. We'll assume n is greater than or equal to one. We're just going to just normalize our writing style. Well, no matter how small a n is, a n could be one over a quadrillion. Eventually, z is so large that this term is going to dwarf everything else. And this is going to be the main idea in several proofs this semester. So what we can do is we can write f of z as a n, z to the n, 1 plus 1, I'm sorry, um, a n minus 1 over a n, 1 over z, plus dot dot dot, plus a 0 over a n, 1 over z to the n. And as you take z larger and larger and larger and larger, all of this stuff over here is eventually at most 1 half in absolute value if the absolute value of z is huge. Because over here, I'm you know, these numbers are fixed, and I'm dividing by higher and higher powers of z. I use the triangle inequality. The absolute value of the sum is less than equal to the sum of the absolute values. What, how big could this piece over here be? Can't be that big. So worst case scenario, this whole thing here is negative 1 half. That would give us the maximum cancellation. Well, we'd then have 1 minus half. This is still going to be positive. So what we've seen is that as z gets very, very large, f of z goes to infinity in absolute value. So there exists an r such that for all z with the absolute value of z greater than r, the absolute value of f of z is going to be um, greater than or equal to, let's figure it out, a n over 2 in absolute value, and then we will have r to the n. Right? As you know, z gets very, very large, this is going to be at least a half an absolute value. So we'll have at least a n over 2 and at least r to the n. Thus, g of z goes to 0 as z goes to infinity. Is it possible that g is not bounded? So now, you know, if you think about it, we have a giant circle of radius r, and g is getting very small outside. What about inside the ball? What do we know about g? Could g blow up inside the ball? Why not? f of z is never 0 by assumption. We're assuming we have a continuous function on a compact set. So this is where we're going to use some results from real analysis. A continuous function on a compact set attains its maximum and minimum. It's bounded. So by real analysis, we know g is bounded inside the disk. g is bounded outside the disk. So g bounded, you know, z less than or equal to r by real analysis. And g is bounded outside the disk, so just take whichever bound is larger. Thus, g is bounded. 
G is entire, therefore G is constant. But G is not constant contradiction. So I wanted to just at least fit the proof into just one board. This is the fundamental theorem of algebra. It follows immediately from complex analysis. So let's just quickly recap what we did. We proved by contradiction, we saw it was enough to show that there's at least one root. Because now what we can do is now that there's a root, we can write f of z as z minus z naught times the remainder and just do polynomial long division and just lather, rinse, repeat, keep doing this. And when you do this, you're going to get a polynomial of smaller degree each time. All right, so I'll let you put in the details of that. So we assume it's not zero, so we can take the reciprocal. That function is going to be holomorphic. We can now use all of our results. Uh, we can show that our function is getting very small as z gets very large. We then end up getting that our function g is bounded. Our function g bounded means g is constant. And then that means f can't vary. Yes? So how do we know that 1 over f of z is holomorphic? Uh, you can actually go back and use the definition. You can use the quotient rule or the inverse rule. What's the derivative of g? It's going to be negative 1 over f squared of z times f prime of z. And because f of z is never 0, our function is differentiable. So the whole thing is as long as, you know, ratios of holomorphic functions are holomorphic. Holomorphic just means complex differentiable. We just try to use a strange word to confuse people who walk into our class. Sorry. And so just by using those old rules, we get that g is differentiable. That's the fundamental theorem of algebra. Okay. This is pretty good dividends. You know, so far, yeah, this is still technically the second week of the course, right? Maybe the start of the third week. Okay, any questions on what we've done up till now? All good? Okay. So I've noticed a couple of you were in probability with me over the years. And this gives me the opportunity of proving maybe the central limit theorem correctly later in the semester. And so this is one of the most important results in mathematics. It's one of the greatest applications of complex analysis of Fourier analysis. It's also one of the strange things that make complex analysis so different from real analysis. So I want to talk about points of accumulation. Every now and then in mathematics we name things well. Points of accumulation is going to be a sequence of points that accumulates, that gets closer and closer and closer to a common value. All right, this is a good name. So we say that, you know, the sequence WK you know, accumulates at Z0 if the limit as K goes to infinity of WK minus Z0 equals 0. So the points all getting closer and closer and closer to z You know, maybe we're spiraling in something like that. Okay? So here is a wonderful theorem. Theorem. Uh, F is holomorphic. So wait, so what's the difference between accumulates and converges? Um, Hmm. Yeah, so maybe, maybe what I want to do here, good, good question. Maybe I could do something like this, where this is a subsequence. If there exists a subsequence, good, good point. So I, I, technically all I need is I need a subsequence that's going to converge to that point. Excellent. Remember to send me an email. So. It's okay you know, if, I'm if I'm alternating back and forth, where maybe some of the points are going off to infinity and the other ones are getting closer and closer. I only care about the part that gets closer and closer. And so a lot of times in applications, I'll just throw away all the points that are not in my subsequence and just take the subsequence that converges to zero. Uh, part of it is, I do apologize for this, but I'm just so used to complex analysis changing the notation and the terminology of everything we use from real analysis that I sometimes don't stop and think about the small little subcases. But thank you for pointing that out. All right, so theorem is f is holomorphic on a open set and a sequence 
WK accumulates to some point Z0 in the set, then F of Z is identically 0. So if you have a function that accumulates on a set and it you know, converges to some point in the set, then the function will be identically 0. Notice I'm being careful, and I'm saying that it's accumulating to a point inside my unit disk, or in, inside my open set. If it's on the boundary, I've got to be a little bit careful because I now have to worry about how I'm drawing things. I don't want to do the most general statement of this result. This is more than enough. Does this result hold for real valued functions? Is this true for real functions? So what about real functions? Do you think if you have a sequence of points where the function is 0 and that converges, then the function must be identically 0? Yes? Oh, whoops. I never said. I said. Sorry. With f of t. Thank you. With f of t. What is f of t? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Complex analysis is not quite this good. Sorry. What is fwk going to be? Zero. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. It has to be zero at those points. Good call. All right. Uh, what about real functions? Do you think this is true for real functions? If you have a real valued function that has a set of points with zero <coughs> and those points say accumulate to the point z naught is zero, do you think that forces the real valued function to be identically zero? What are those strange oscillating functions you might remember? The sine of 1 over x. And if you want, Put an x to the 2015 outside just to give yourself a couple of de derivatives. So you know, this function is going to be differentiable at least 100 times. Eventually, it will stop being differentiable, but it will be differentiable for a while. It's highly oscillatory, and this function will be 0 countably many times, and it will be 0 at 0, but this function is not identically 0. You, we would define it to be 0 at 0, or we can define it any way we want, but the natural way to define it would be uh, 0 at x equals 0. And so the answer for real valued functions is no. Complex analysis is very different. Now this is going to be amazing. We will be able to use this to determine when two complex functions are the same. Because if we look at the difference between f and g, if f and g agree on a set of points that accumulate inside that set, then they must be identical. This is what we're going to need if we get to the central limit theorem when we want to prove, say, a sequence of moments is enough to uniquely determine a probability distribution. In 341, I had to wear you know, kid gloves. I had to look at integral moments. Gloves come off now. Now we can look at non-integral moments. We can even look at complex moments. And the result we'll get is if you have two probability distributions that agree on a sequence of moments that accumulate, then they must be the same. And this will allow us to prove the fundamental theme of, I'm sorry, no, we, no it doesn't have the fundamental theme, sorry. This will allow us to prove the central limit theme. It's not <laughs> fundamental, it's only central to the subject. Whole level of classification. All right, so let's prove that you know, points that accumulate imply that the function is identically zero. I think the last time I taught this class, I didn't include the proof of this, but it's such a nice result, it, it's worth doing. All right, so proof. So without loss of generality, assume wk converges to z0. And what do you want, we want to make z0 equal to be? Just to make life easy. Zero. You know, let's just make our life simpler. If there are some points in the sequence wk that aren't converging to z0, throw them away. 
And instead of writing Z0, let's just write 0. Let's just renormalize everything. It's not going to make any major difference. All right, so now we have a sequence of points where f of wk equals 0. What is f of 0 equal to? Has to be equal to 0. Why? Continuity. Every now and then, we don't have to use the fact that we're in complex analysis. We can actually go back to just real analysis and say, hey, our function's continuous. We can exploit properties of continuity. We don't need to constantly be using the big guns of complex analysis. Yes, the function is holomorphic, but all we need here is continuity. What do we know about holomorphic functions? What, don't take this the wrong way, what useful fact do we know about holomorphic functions? So we have somebody who's visiting us. I'm very grateful that we have a prospective student who is braving this. He has not heard what holomorphic means. Can anybody give me another word for holomorphic? We ought to use that word earlier today. Holomorphic is a, is a fancy way of saying differentiable. So if you say a function is holomorphic in complex analysis, that means it's differentiable. We have a big theorem, though, that says that holomorphic also means analytic. analytic. So whenever you see the word holomorphic, you should also be thinking analytic. It's given by its Taylor series. So f of z is equal to the sum of a n, z to the n, n goes from 0 to infinity about 0. And this is because it's holomorphic. Holomorphic equals analytic. <coughs> OK? Choose smallest n such that a n does not equal 0. What can you tell me about the value of that n? Could n be 0? No, because if n was 0, then our function would not be 0 at 0. So n is greater than or equal to 1. Is it possible that there is no smallest n? And what would happen if there's no smallest n? Then it's identically 0, right? If no smallest n, we're done. You know, then we have f of z is identically 0. So you just have to make sure you, co you cover all the cases. You know, in the book, they talk about you know, choose the n. Well, what if there is no such n? Well, if there's no such n, it's not so bad. Every coefficient then is 0. The function f of z is 0. Now you need to prove that f is 0 on the set. Not that hard. All right, so now we can write f of z as the following a n z to the n 1 plus the sum now write it over like this 1 over a n the sum n goes from n plus 1 to infinity of a n z to the n minus n we just saw this trick earlier today it now moves up from trick to technique. Right? Once you've used it multiple times, it becomes a method. We can write our function like this. A n does not equal 0, so I can pull it out. And so what we really have is we have our function as a n z to the n 1 plus, let's call this g of z. What do we know about g of 0? So g of 0 is 0 because the smallest value of little n is big N plus 1 as a multiple of z. What do we know about g of z if z is very close to 0? Has to be close to 0. So there exists 
a uh, r such that if the absolute value of z is less than r, g of z in absolute value will be less than 1 half. Just by continuity. By continuity of g. g is a continuous function. Look at it in terms of, you know, we're inside the radius of convergence. You have facts about how large the limb soups of the a n to the 1 over n's can grow. If z is sufficiently small, this will converge. By continuity, it has to converge to something near 0. So you can restrict yourself to a small enough window. And in that small enough window, this is going to be not too large. Well, the advantage of this being not too large is then it can't completely cancel out the 1. The only way f of some point could be 0 is either z equals 0 or this equals negative 1. So if z is sufficiently small and z does not equal 0, f of z does not equal 0. But this violates f of wk equals 0. Because the whole point was we had a sequence that accumulates at 0 where the function was 0 at each of those points. We just showed that the function can only be 0 in a small neighborhood at 0 itself. Contradiction. Therefore, what do we get? And what can we conclude? There's no small stand. So f is identically 0 in a small neighborhood of 0. This does not prove that it's 0 in the whole open set. It just proves that near this one point, it's 0. OK? So we haven't quite finished the proof yet, but we're close. So if you want, you usually use dotted lines for the open set. So here is maybe our point, And we now know that there's an open set here where the function is identically 0. We want to show that the function is identically 0 everywhere in this set. So if you call the space omega, so we want to show f is 0 everywhere in omega. We just know it's 0 in a neighborhood of a point that accumulates. OK? So now the rest of the proof is done using some topology. So rest is topology that if I have omega equals u union v disjoint both open and possible, that I cannot write an open set as a union of two open sets without them having things in common. Okay, So this is where we need to use some results from real analysis. They talk a little bit about this earlier in the book. OK, so now just to quickly finish this. So we could, finishing, let u be all points where f is 0. OK? Is this an open set or a closed set?
What do you think? So we looked at one specific place. We looked at you know, a point where we accumulated, and then we were zero in a neighborhood of that. So it should be open. So the question is always, how much topology do you guys know? And depending on the amount of topology you know, we then put on different restrictions in terms of the sets. So what kind of set do we want to look at? So let's assume our set is connected. This is going to be extremely important. If I now tell you the set is connected, you know, we have, oops, I want to do dotted lines. So we have a connected set omega. We're not going to do too much topology in this class, but I want you to see a little bit about what goes on. So we have a sequence of points that's accumulating over here, and so we get that there's some open disk where the function is 0. Now, if you take any point in this open disk, can you draw a small open disk where the function will be 0? Why? It's open, right? So just choose a sufficiently small radius, and you'll stay inside that open disk. So if you take any point inside this open set, in this little open disk right now, you know the function is going to be 0 in that set, so I can draw a little bit point there. Good. What if I take a boundary point on this open set? You know, I'm still inside my omega. Can I draw a small ball about this point? And will my function be identically 0 in that small ball? Why? I have points accumulating from inside. Right? So this is how we're expanding out the boundary. Okay? So what we start is, is we start here with 0. We start off with an open disk, and f is identically 0 in here. We now take a point on the boundary, and we draw a small circle about that point. And now we take this chain of points that accumulates here. And because we have a chain of points that accumulate here, the function must be identically 0 in a small neighborhood of this point. And this allows you to push the boundary of this out a little bit. And you can keep pushing it out and pushing it out and pushing it out. And so what you now get is that any point here where the function is 0, starting off from here, is going to be, uh, you're going to get that it's an open set. It's also going to be a closed set because it contains its boundary points. And you'll only, the only way you can have an open set and a closed set relative to omega is to be all of omega. So I'm not going to finish the argument. This is done in the book. This is enough of an, uh, it for me in terms of just topologically what's going on. We get that the set of points where it's 0 is both open and closed with respect to omega. Or there's a way of partitioning our set into u and v where they're open and disjoint. Uh, because our set of points where it's 0 because it contains all of its uh, limit points, the complement is also open. So if you look at the, po the points in omega where our function is not 0, that's an open set. And these two sets are clearly disjoint. You know, I'm splitting my space omega into two sets, one where f is 0, one where f is not 0. Do they have any points in common? No, 0 does not non-zero. So that's a way to partition. So u would be the set of z in omega where f of z equals 0, and then v would be the set of z in omega where f of z does not equal 0. Both of them are open. And they're disjoint. And so this finishes the proof. So again, we're not going to do too much topology. It's fine if you're not comfortable with all the different stuff here. I think this is a really clever idea 
of you know, pushing it out and expanding it, you first know it only in a small little neighborhood. And then you show that that neighborhood actually just grows and takes over the entire thing. So now, as a nice corollary, so corollary, say F and G are holomorphic on a connected open set omega. Let's say F of Z equals ZK equals G of ZK on a set that accumulates in omega, then f equals g on omega. That if two functions agree on a sequence that accumulates in that space, and it, then they must be equal. This is wildly different from real analysis. Why do you think complex analysis is so different than real analysis? Holomorphic is so strong that as soon as we say a function is differentiable, that puts in a lot of information. It gives us the Cauchy-Riemann equations. We have the Cauchy integral formula. Once you know the boundary, it fills in on the interior. And you have no choice but how to uh, finish things off. OK. Any questions about what we've done so far? All right, we have one minute left. And so for the one minute left, I just want to do some notation. So we were a little bit ahead of schedule from two years ago, and so I thought it was worth going into the details of the accumulation arguments. So notation. Let's say f of z is you know, a n z to the n plus, well, we'll do more generally, z minus z naught to the n plus a n plus 1, z minus z naught to the n plus 1 plus dot dot dot. If n is greater than 0, we have a 0 of order n at z0. If n is less than 0, we have a pole of order negative n at z0. And so this is just very useful notation. It turns out that what is the value of n that's going to matter most? Yeah. Not 0. Negative, negative 1. So the a to the negative 1 coefficient controls all. And what we're going to do on Friday is we will show how to, wait, is today Friday? OK, what we'll do on whatever the next day is, I, I guess it's Monday, we will show how this allows us to do integration. How many of you remember the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared? Octan. Well, OK, so you can integrate that. You don't need complex analysis. You have great memories. But what about 1 over 1 plus x to the fourth? Do you know an antiderivative for that? We're going to see how to integrate all of this stuff trivially by bypassing integration and going to algebra. We'll only have to find the a to the negative 1 coefficients. If only we knew ways to find roots and zeros. Oh, wait, we do. Well, kind of. So just as a last little note, the fundamental theorem of algebra is an existence theorem. It says a root exists. It says the right number of roots exists. It does not say how to find them. We leave that to your applied math classes. <laughs>